through various methods of dating, we know that the solar system is around 4.5 billion years old. And shortly after the Sun formed, there was a massive disk made out of particles that over some time bundled up in different parts, eventually creating planets as large as Jupiter and as small as Mercury. And one of those planets made through that process was the Earth. Now we know as well that the Moon also formed about 4.5 billion years ago. So how did that come to be? Well, there are three possible scenarios. One says that it simply could have just formed alongside the Earth. Another one says that it formed at a place much further out from the Earth and then was later gravitationally captured as it was ejected out of its orbit. Since all sorts of objects back then were forming, being impacted and ejected. So the solar system was incredibly active back then. That leads us to another very exciting possibility. And that is that the Earth was struck by a massive planetary sized object and out of the debris that was left flying outwards from the impact, that debris settled into orbit and it bundled up, forming the moon. That also could explain why the rocks on the moon have some significant similarities to the ones on the Earth. It's also interesting to think as to how many planets were there in total, because considering how active the solar system was back then, likely there are quite a few planets that eventually just merged with other planets, leaving behind barely any hints that they were ever there. So considering that we know through precise estimates that the moon is moving away from the Earth, at a rate of about 3.8 centimeters a year, then that nearly certainly means that the moon was much closer to the Earth when it first formed. But the moon isn't always moving away from the Earth throughout time at the same speed. Depending on what was happening with the Earth, it was either moving away really fast at about 20 centimeters a year, or pretty slow at 0.2 centimeters a year. Still, with all of the moving away together, the estimate is that the moon relatively soon after it formed was at a distance from the Earth of about 30,000 kilometers, so about 12 times closer than it is right now, meaning that the moon appeared about 11 to 12 times larger in the sky compared to how the moon appears now. And the evidence through examining the lunar rock samples is that there is too much of a certain crystallized structure, a mineral which only crystallizes at very high temperatures, suggesting that the surface of the moon at a point of formation through really fast accumulation was hot enough for it to be entirely magma, meaning that there is a good chance that from the Earth, the moon back then appeared as a huge ball covered entirely with liquid rock. So after it cooled down, after the formation, it got the appearance of a pretty smooth, reflective, and evenly toned ball, and there likely wasn't much of the moon's soil present then. The regolith that is present currently builds up over time through many mechanisms. The first large grey area, South Pole Aintken Basin, formed 4.3 billion years ago. The crater density very clearly indicates its age. It's about as cratered as the more pale surface, and considering that it is quite deep compared to the surrounding surface, at about 6 to 8 kilometers of depth and is circular, it most likely is an ancient crater and is one of the largest, if not the largest impact that has ever occurred on the moon so far. Quite possibly this large impact cracked the surface enough for the flooding of magma below the surface to start, eventually solidifying and creating the grayness, the basalt rock that it has. But as the solar system was still very active, it had plenty of objects flying around, so most of the craters we see today on the moon formed from around 4.4 to 3 billion years ago. The surface on the moon, because it was constantly bombarded with objects, was shattered and heated enough such that it activated the volcanic activity of the moon for quite some time. The evidence suggests that the most intense volcanic activity happened around between 4 to 3 billion years ago. Over that course of time, as the molten rock started flooding that surface of the moon, it eventually covered about 15% of the surface with basalt, solidified magma, that in a significant proportion has iron and magnesium. And that created the Great Plains of the Moon 
that are visible today pretty clearly, even with the naked eye. The grey areas, the mares, are also not quite as cratered as the more pale areas, as they are newer, and they are also quite a bit below zero meters. Now on Earth, zero meters of height is considered the sea level, but on the Moon there is no sea, so instead what is zero meters there is what the mean radius of the Moon is. And then obviously, any surface below the mean radius is a general depression, or if it is above the mean radius, it is a general protrusion. Now the mares of the moon have a depth of about 4 to 2 kilometers, and on top of that, they are pretty smooth. As the magma flowed there, it eventually cooled down and solidified, covering the traces of the previous impact craters that were there, that were a result of a previous bombardment, leading to relatively smooth gray plains that we see on the moon today. And through analyzing some of the samples that we have from the moon, there are also indications that it also had a significant atmosphere, as during the constant volcanic eruptions, as the gas was frequently released, there was a buildup of gases. The hints are that the atmosphere lasted for about a hundred million years, sometime between three to four billion years ago, likely at a peak volcanic activity. And the atmosphere was about likely two times more thick than the atmosphere of the current Mars so about 1% the thickness of the current atmosphere of Earth. Eventually, because the volcanic activity stopped being so intense, there was nothing to replenish the atmosphere, and then the atmosphere just went away because of solar winds blowing it off and low surface gravity making it escape. Now, through constant bombardment and volcanic activity, pretty much most of the significant features on the Moon, such as the mares, ridges, mountains and valleys formed. Through radiometric dating, we also know that the geological activity of the Moon stopped being so relatively intense 3 billion years ago, but still continued for about 2 billion years more, and eventually nearly entirely ending about a billion years ago. We can be pretty certain that a Moon a billion years ago looked pretty similar to today. Still, that's not to say that the geological activity of the Moon is entirely dead, just nearly. Some evidence suggests that there has been volcanic activity on the Moon that happened within the last 50 million years. But other than that, it's mostly not very active, and today there are no active volcanoes. Also, the Moon is still accumulating craters, although at a pace much slower compared to the much more active early solar system. One significant crater that formed from an impact that happened about a hundred million years ago is the crater Tycho. It is 85 kilometers in diameter and 4.5 kilometers deep, with a pretty interesting looking sharp peak in the center that formed out of the impact. The peak has a height of about 1.5 kilometers. This crater formed when the dinosaurs were still alive. Just maybe, some might have even spotted the impact occurring. Today, the layer of the moon's regolith, moon's soil, is now thicker than ever covering the entire hard bedrock surface of the Moon with a layer that is 5 to 15 meters of thickness. It is generally 5 meters in the mares, which makes sense since they are newer. Now, this soil was accumulating throughout the lifespan of the Moon, as a result from the meteorites and micrometeorites breaking up the surface into finer and finer pieces, and the solar winds, high energy particles, also doing the same. Looking at the weight of just pure elements, without what they are bound to, then in general, oxygen is actually what the lunar soil contains in the largest proportion, at 40%, followed by silicon at 20%, and the rest is all sorts of things, like aluminium, iron, calcium, sodium, and so on. Then as we move forward into the future, for hundreds of millions of years, there won't be much of a difference, it will just continue gathering new craters and moving away from the Earth. Possibly, maybe some small-scale volcanic activity will also happen again. Still, what is certain is that, since the Sun will be increasing its fusion, eventually it will reach a point in fusion acceleration at which the core will be hot enough such that the layer beyond the core will inflate dramatically. We know this through observing other stars of about the same mass, 
which have the same composition in the same proportion throughout time, making them act in a linear fashion. Seven billion years from now, the sun will enter the red giant phase, and it will inflate its layer beyond the core to about 150 million kilometers away from the center of the sun. Now, it's very much uncertain as to whether or not the Earth and the Moon will be engulfed by the Sun as it is expanding. It's pretty clear that Mercury will, and Venus very likely. But if the expansion of the Sun goes quite a bit beyond 150 million kilometers, and there isn't enough mass loss, such that the Moon and the Earth move further outwards enough, it's then very much possible that the Ben Magma Moon and Earth will simply be engulfed by the Sun. In which case, that is where the history of the Moon and the Earth ends. But if that doesn't happen, then things get really uncertain, and there are all sorts of hypotheses regarding as to what would then happen. So focusing on just one, the Moon and the Earth will start moving away from the Sun as it is fusing more and losing mass. If by that time the Sun loses a certain plausible amount of mass, then the Moon and the Earth will move away enough so that they are not engulfed by the Sun. But at likely distances that will be established, they will be receiving tens of thousands of more sunlight than they do now. The Sun will take up most of the view on one side of them. Now that will be enough for the rock on their surfaces to be melted, creating magma oceans. Still, eventually the Sun will run out of things to fuse, and at a critical point it will shed its outer layer, creating a nebula, and leaving only the dense tiny core about the volume of the Earth, but around 200,000 times more dense than the Earth, and that dense core will be the start of the White Dwarf phase of the Sun. As the surface area of the White Dwarf Sun will be tiny, it won't be releasing enough energy to continually heat the Moon and the Earth, which will then cause the magma oceans to solidify. Then all over again, as if it's a brand new start, the moon will be clear of craters and evenly toned. As the billions of years pass, the moon will again start accumulating craters. Possibly, there will again be some significant volcanic activity. The evidence suggests that the moon, even though it is moving away, as it is moving away further outwards from the Earth, it is generally doing so at a slower and slower pace. Eventually, it is likely going to come to a near halt. From that point into the future, the Moon will simply accumulate craters, get colder and colder as the White Dwarf Sun is running out of stored energy, and eventually it will be left in near-complete darkness when the White Dwarf Sun runs completely out of stored energy, in some hundreds of billions if not a trillion years from now. <laughs>